Um, and apologies again for those who had to fight their way in from a variety of access points. Um, I don't think you need an enormous introduction from me about the significance or indeed the timeliness of what we are discussing uh, this morning. Um, because it seems to me that there is about three or four forces pushing in at the same time. One is the sheer logic of events, the unfinished business from 1999 onwards. And it's very nice for all of us to poke a finger in whatever settlements were hurriedly put in place at the time, but the reality still is that if you look at almost any conflict in Europe, it usually starts with a hurried settlement, which usually makes very little sense, but then develops into something that is more stable. So I think one criticism that a future generation, even beyond me, will make about the, uh, uh, the, the crisis is that perhaps we let the eye off the ball for very obvious reasons, 9-11 and everything else that followed, but we, lay, we sort of let off the eye off the ball in the case of Kosovo sometime between 1999 and 2001. A second point which is coming forward is, of course, the demand of the Kosovo residents for a statehood that means a statehood. And that sometimes is perfectly acceptable, but sometimes it brings its own problems. We need only mention the subject of an armed forces in order to understand uh, how tricky the issue is. And thirdly, it is to try to fit Kosovo into a regional security structure that makes sense and is self-standing. And that is a job for generations, but it is a job which can no longer be postponed. I'm delighted to have uh, General Giovanni Fungo with us today for many reasons. First, because he's an unusual general in the sense that he had three exposures to the crisis in Kosovo in terms of deployments, plus an, an exposure in Rome in terms of both his military career and dealing with the media, all of which are enormously important ingredients in dealing with the current uh, situation. Still the scars. Uh, sorry? Still bearing, Still bearing the scars, we all do. Um, so I think that's one. Secondly, because he represents Italy, and in a curious way, you know, just a day from now, we are going to uh, mark the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. I know it's not a fashionable treaty in London, since it established the European Union, but I think Italy is a good example that you could be a good NATO member and a good European Union member, and that the contradiction between the two is not as big as it's sometimes made by people. So in a way, the general represents both the best of Italy but also um, uh, someone who has got an enormous amount of experience in dealing with the problems of the region. The General will speak for about 30 minutes, and then genuinely I hope that all of you will join me in a serious discussion. General, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, let me point out that uh, we are having this meeting in a very peculiar moment. There was a terrorist attack yesterday, and uh, late in the night, it was 11 o'clock more or less, I was driving back towards my hotel. I realized that London didn't stop. Everything was going on as usual. And it's something that reminds me the sense and the character of the Brits that was portrayed in the 1940, when despite all the attacks from the air, London didn't stop. Therefore, it's something the Brits have to be very proud of, of their, this character, of this stamina, that despite the events, despite whatever terrible is happening, they go on. And that's national characteristic that you must be very proud of. Second point in terms of time. Looking at the, the audience today, I realized that uh, probably back in 1999, the bulk of the people's presence was still in primary school. <laughs> Therefore, it's something that we have to take into consideration when we talk about knowledge of the crisis as well. Well, I think this is... Wait a click from the, on the side of the... On the side. One more. And again, thank you. 
Okay. Well, let's start uh, with the uh, with the picture. This is the Cosmopolitan battle. It was a post Middle Age battle, a mess. Keep it in mind for the final remarks. It basically was a messy battlefield. But let's start uh, understanding what is Kosovo. Kosovo remains an extremely challenging operational environment, still after almost 18, 18, 18 years. Even if 18 years after the start of NATO operations in that area. There are many reasons that explain the challenges that KFOR and the international community are still facing. We'll have a close look at most of them, but in order to properly set the scene, let us start with a very easy question. What is Kosovo? Is a province of southern Serbia? Yes, if we consider literally the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1244, dated 12 June 1999. The, res the resolution, by the way, has never been amended or, re or re revised since then. Is it a geographical area under some sort of international supervision? Yes, that could be the right answer. If you look in perspective at that very same resolution, and we think at the role that is still played by ANMIC, that means the United Nations, ULEX, that means the European Union, and KFOR, that is NATO, plus other international actors that are very active in Kosovo still in the current days. What about instead an independent state? Kosovo unilaterally declared its independence back in 2008. And since then, it has been recognized by 114 different states, Bangladesh being the, let, the latter. And of course, there is a British embassy in Pristina. All these answers are correct, regardless of the fact that they portray Kosovo in very different and opposing ways. You will allow me to pose a second important question. What is the Kosovo force, or K4, as we, use, as we usually call it? Is it the security guarantor of Kosovo Serbs who feel threatened by their Kosovo Albanian neighbors? Is it an impartial peacekeeping force deployed under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter on the basis of UNSCR 1244? Or rather a NATO capability building presence aimed at developing local capacities in view of their future Euro-Atlantic integration? Once again, all these answers are to some extent correct. And they depict a challenging framework, exactly how I was trying to convince you at the very beginning of my introdu introduction, with the pictures of the kosovo polia battle. We will now look at the current situation, but in order to do s it correctly, I will have to start with the big picture first. Kosovo cannot be examined as a matter of fact without a short overview of the entire Western Balkans of their current geopolitical dimension and the contradiction that character characterized this region and still do today. Kosovo is the late product of the dissolution of former Yugoslavia, where ethnic confrontations are still having a very fertile ground. Today, renewed tensions shake the entire region, with Bosnia and Herzegovina seriously questioning the delicate balance built with the Dayton Peace Agreement and the non-easy coexistence of three different entities. Nationalism and separatism are quite evident in the rhetoric of the Republika Srpska, with President Dodic strongly backed by Russia and to some extent by Serbia. Serbia, apart from the many open issues with Pristina, is struggling with its aspiration to join the European Union, against its still evident, never abandoned, to, to a certain extent, anti-NATO sentiments. And the perception of becoming more and more encircled by NATO member states is being addressed through an aggressive rearmament program, or better, a modernization program, that is uh, also sponsored by Russia, that sometimes is felt and perceived like the holy mother of Russia. And there is a worrying attitude of, with vis-a-vis uh, -vis Croatia, a neighbor as well as an old enemy, still in the current days. This strong, renewed Russian influence can be clearly felt across the whole Western Balkans. In Montenegro, where an alleged failed coup engulfs the aftermath of the recent elections and still threatens the now close accession to NATO of the small republic. In Fyron, where more than two years of deep political crisis have not been overcome 
and by the latest round of elections, where three months of political stalemate, stalemate actually failed to allow the formation of a government, with growing tensions across political parties and along ethnic lines and serious risks of spillover to and from its neighboring countries. The instability that characterized the current situation in the Balkans a few months ago made me think at Kosovo a relatively calm and stable environment. Paradoxically, please keep this in mind, projecting stability throughout the region, thanks also to a significant international pre presence, K4 in premise. But I was concerning Kosovo from a static point of view, basically looking at the status quo that was artificially created and then maintained by Security Council resolution that proved to have failed in adapting to a changing and challenging dynamic environment. The same Kosovo that is sometimes blamed to be a failing or failed state, the same Kosovo that is clearly leaving an important economic and social development, the same Kosovo that has started its long path towards the European Union, signing an extremely important stabilization and association agreement, but failing to obtain visa liberalization from the Schengen area. The same Kosovo that is somehow divided by the Ibar River and the famous Austerlitz Bridge, place for a lot of troubles, that is sometimes described as the cradle of the Serbian Orthodox religion, or whose landscape is the more and more characterized by a growing number of mosques and minarets. We have 700 mosques in Kosovo. Without a sound assessment of the complexity of this Kosovo and all this contradiction, you would not have the right tools to understand the war <coughs> is currently being fought in Kosovo. Yes, I'm meaning a war. A complex, challenging war of symbols. Unfortunately, we will not find the expression war of symbols in any manner or book. So I will do my best to explain what we are currently facing in Kosovo in terms of war. Let's start with a clear example. Christ the Savior Church. It is an unfinished Orthodox Church in the very town center of Pristina, built under the Milosevic regime, close to the old mosque and to the brand new Catholic cathedral. Fake news hinting at a possible desecration conducted by Kosovo Albanians. A bishop in great pomp leading a small group of monks armed with brooms, paint and brushes. A grey bureaucrat from the Special Environment Office at the municipality bringing papers full of stamps declaring whatever renovation work is illegal. A Serb politician denouncing these crimes as a proof of the incapacity of the institution in Kosovo to join UNESCO, a field for political debate. A group of students from Pristina University protesting in front of the church faced by 30 policemen wearing full gears almost one policeman for each student. The dean of the university accusing the church that it was illegally built on a piece of land owned by the university itself. The patriarch of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Belgrade remembered that Kosovo is our Jerusalem, a very inflammatory statement. The international community calling for restraint from both parties. Tensions increasing across communities and countries intelligence hinting at the possibility of a bombing attack against the church, and then, all of a sudden, as if by magic, the focus of this church vanish to be immediately redirected on a new pressing and challenging symbol. Therefore, they set the bar, they reach the level of the crisis, and then everything is a step back. We experienced a series of symbols over the past six months, like the wall in Mitrovica Nord, the famous propaganda train, the bridge 167, the Trepchka mines, or memory plucking in the vicinity of Malizevo village. We don't bother you with details about these other symbols, not worry, but keep in mind that every time that there was a new symbol brought to the attention of the media, of the public opinion, the crisis solution bar was put at a higher step. What I meant instead is to better characterize this war of symbols. Imagine a stop or kettle, like the one that each of you has for preparing tea. As soon as you put it on the fire, the temperature of the water will start to increase. At the very beginning, quite slowly, and then the more and more quickly. At a certain point, you should be familiar with this, the steam whistle will indicate that you had the water is boiling. 
you can go ahead with the preparation of your tea. If you do not hear the whistle in time, troubles might then occur. The same happens with the world symbols. If you are not carefully listening for the whistle, you may have serious troubles, eventually setting everything on fire. The example of the cattle fits perfectly for those who live south of the river Ibar. Of course, if you are living in the northern of Kosovo, you would use a samovar instead. This world symbol is therefore characterized by high pressure, medium tempo, and low intensity. It works with highly symbolic issues, it makes use that it spreads through all sorts of new media, and is strictly connected with politics and harsh political rhetoric. It is strongly anchored on local culture, habits, and small history. Small history over there is something that can cause crisis in a matter of minutes. This proves something difficult for a full understanding of different perceptions and reactions. Therefore, you are on the field, you think that your reactions is sound, is military good, you are making a big trouble at the operational level. To balance the effects of this war and to stabilize this tiny portion of the Balkans, we have the K-4, a relatively small peacekeeping force, the size of a good, solid brigade with a sizable tactical reserve, a large two-star headquarters working at the tactical, to some extent, at the operational level at the same time. Three are the main reference documents that are ruling the work of K4. First of all, the well-known UNSCR 1244, unchanged since 1999. The Military Technical Agreement, or MTA, that was signed by General Jackson and the representative of the old Yugoslavian army, and the undertaking on dem demilitarization transformation of the UCK, signed again by General Jackson with the Mr. Ashim Tachi, the former UCK commander, and nowadays President of the Republic of Kosovo. To enforce provisions of these documents, K4 operates along three main lines of operation. First, contribute to a safe and secure environment and the freedom of movement for all communities despite their ethnicity or their religion. Assist and advise the Kosovo security organizations. Support within means and capabilities the international community. Security across the country is guaranteed through three layers of responsibility. The Kosovo police being the first responder, ULEX, that is the EU rule of law mission established in 2008, being the second responder, and K4 the third and the last one. K4 maintains certain responsibility with regard to border monitoring duties, in particular along the ABL, the administrative boundary line between Serbia and Kosovo as well as for the protection of certain sites of particular value, notably the Vizoki Monastery in the Chani. The force is a combination of kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities, bringing together light infantry forces and small teams, the liaison and monitoring teams, that are more focused on influence, atmospherics and civil-military cooperation. The work of K4 is heavily supported and very much dependent on the availability of proper information and adequate intelligence not the usual intelligence that is thought by the military practitioners. And this is done mainly through the capabilities that are being deployed under the brand new ISR battalion. The ISR battalion is a state-of-the-art project grouping together different capabilities such as reconnaissance, surveillance, human intelligence, signal intelligence, image intelligence, and even more challenging, several nations under the same umbrella. This multinational is a real challenge in the intelligence field. It is an initial project in this respect that I'm confident that will bring fresh ideas and new concepts within NATO and even beyond in terms of uh, expeditionary warfare. The second line of operation sees K4 in a more supporting role working alongside the Kosovo police and the Kosovo security force and other relevant Kosovo institutions and body more or less involved in security and emergency management. I will not elaborate more on this aspect, though later I will have to come back to the role of KSF in a more specific way. Last but not least, K4 has long-time partnership with most of the international organizations that are present and active throughout Kosovo. ANMIC, the European Union, the OSCE, ULEX, UNDP, IOM and many others. All of them have a quite a good economic footprint on the region. 
This is part of Nathan K for overall comprehensive approach, implemented through the development of synergies as well as the exchange and or sharing of appropriate information. Way ahead. The operating environment in Kosovo has changed significantly in the past 18 years and will continue to do so in the future with new challenges, new symbols, but also new opportunities. K4 has constantly adapted its role and its structure in order to tackle all these issues in the most effective way and to continue to deliver security and stability across the region. But a number of uncertainties and challenges are right in front of us. The presidential elections in Serbia in two weeks' time and how they will be conducted in Kosovo because the, minor the Serbian minority will be able to vote. The recently announced project for the transformation of the Kosovo security force Today, a lightly armed civil protection corps that is supposed to be transformed into the future army of Kosovo. This project is challenging the remaining validity of the UNSCR 1244 and of the and military technical agreement that they, uh, they, they have never been changed since 1999. And from Christina's point of view, this uh, transformation will complete its past towards complete sovereignty making, of course, Belgrade feeling extremely nervous, to be polite, with the risk of further destabilization of the whole region. Furthermore, there is the likely return to the Balkans of those foreign fighters who are already are and will be fleeing from Iraq and Syria, bearing in mind that Kosovo was able to generate the largest number of foreign fighters per capita in Europe. You understand that this is something that makes me sleep quite uncomfortable every night. The refugee migrant crisis is still heavily affecting the region. Although Kosovo is not positioned along the main Balkan route, numbers might become particularly relevant for the limited capaci capacities available in Kosovo to host migrants. And of course, this Balkan route is likely to become the easiest opportunity for those foreign fighters coming back to their homes. The growing war in Russian influence in the region though not necessarily in Kosovo, I repeat, not necessarily in Kosovo, at this stage, influence that is negatively affecting Euro-Atlantic aspirations of several Balkan countries are being influenced by these Russian activities, and progressively shifting the delicate balance towards East and Turkey in certain cases. There is an economic development that is constantly growing, although not at a sufficient pace, thus severely affecting unemployment, in particular within the younger generation. Young people, they want to work, and they have to go outside of the region to find their jobs. Furthermore, there is a deep social crisis, a problem and a risk that is currently not addressed fully by political leaders, who seem to be the more and more distant from their people and do not understand the latter requirements. But this is something I need an open discussion with you, and I'm waiting for your input on that. All these spices and different ingredients contribute to make our tea, or infusion to be more precise, particularly intense and with stimulating properties. You just need to take your kettle, power the water, and taste it. At this stage, no big changes are foreseen to K4 mission, task and structure in terms of number. Although the possible creation of the Kosovo army might require, in the future, some adjustments to the way we will conduct business together. K4, of course, is working to meet those conditions that will allow a gradual reduction of the force and the endeavor of several tasks to appropriate security organizations. While significant achievements were got in the past, just to give some figures, K4 was able to scale down from 50,000 soldiers back in 1999 to 4,300 in the current situation, protecting some uh, 150 static sites in 1999 protected only one static site in the current situation. NATO and member states will have to understand to this respect that careful presence in the Balkan will and be still be required for some time. I did not volunteer to become the commanding general of the Kosovo force, but I like the job and I'm proud of the commitment that all my troops belong to 31 different nations. 31 nations, that's the real political strength of the force. When I approach someone, I, say, I can say I have 30 nations backing my action. Kosovo 
and the Balkans, in Western Balkans in general, are extremely challenging, requiring a delicate balance of subtle diplomacy, solid motivation, and firm strength. K4 is the longest NATO operation ever, has been able to project stability across the region so far. <coughs> the challenges that these world symbols put in front of us, as well as the instability and the tensions we currently experience, can be transformed into opportunities to further proceed towards the virtuous, sustainable stabilization of Kosovo and the Western Balkans in their enlarged influence. We know that, we work for that. This is another drawing of the Kosovo Polier battle. If you remember the first one, this is even more messier. Therefore, we want to stay with uh, a mess that is understandable, like the first drawing, and stay away from this drawing that doesn't portray in a clear way who is fighting who. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Thank you for pointing, for painting a picture that is <clears throat> on the one hand quite somber, but at the same time quite enduring in a sense that you said you quite welcome the possibilities or indeed the trend of reducing the size of K4. You quite welcome the fact that K4 may be the third responder in the future. This is right and proper if this is going to become a normal part of Europe, uh, but you do not welcome suggestions that the business has been accomplished or that indeed uh, we now need to move to a completely uh, different framework. Uh, right, uh, we have a good chunk of time now so I will take both comments and questions and since we are going to spend at least half a day here together the comments don't need to be addressed only to the speaker. They could be addressed to the audience and could be picked up by other members of the audience as well. Uh, the intention is to have a, a proper discussion. Who would like to start? <laughs>